I'm excited to welcome to this podcast my dear friend, Mark Vonnegut, who I've known for decades and decades. He's a wonderful writer. He's had a couple of books about medicine. He's a, uh, for, for decades, he's had a, a, a pediatrics practice, and, and he has written a new, a new book, which describes in the clearest, most wonderful terms what it's like to shift from having a wonderful uh, practice to being at the mercy of some bigger sources. And the other thing is he's very funny. So I just want to welcome Mark Vonnegut to the show. Welcome to Conversations with Shem. focus is to show how to put the human back into healthcare. excited to be introducing yet another episode of Conversations with Shem. Um, and let me introduce the folks who are going to be speaking in a casual conversation. First, we all know Dr. Samuel Shem. He is the author of The House of God and Man's Fourth Best Hospital and a professor of medicine and medical humanities at NYU Grossman Medical Center. So um, hi, Shem, and welcome back. And then across Hello. from him virtually is going to be Dr. Mark Vonnegut, who who is a primary care pediatrician for 40 years and author of three books. The latest is called The Heart of Caring, A Life in Pediatrics and is due out in October of 2021. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome the two in their discussion. So welcome. <laughs> Well, welcome, Mark, my dear friend, my dear old friend, not as old as me. Uh, I'm uh, very, very happy to have this uh, chance to talk with you about something that we've talked and talked and talked about. And uh, you always have something important to say, partially because you are one of my few friends who really is in the thick of modern medicine with the pediatric practice. And uh, as, a, as you know, what we're going to talk about is very, very simple because it's the most urgent thing that's going on in medicine, which is uh, what's inhuman about medicine. That's the number one topic. And number two is how to put the human back into medicine. So what do you think? <laughs> I think as usual, you're absolutely right. And uh, I miss our lunches at Legal Seafoods, That's which right. we'll, we'll be doing again. Um, so um, I think anybody who went into medicine did so with idealism. They wanted to help people. Uh, and if people went into medicine for money, they're probably not smart enough to do the job. And I think that's especially <laughs> true in pediatrics and psychiatry. Um, so, and I, the question, as I see it, about uh, keeping humanity 
or getting humanity back into medicine uh, amounts to protecting clinicians and patients from, um, from all these so-called uh, transformative uh, innovations and the delivery of healthcare because what they do, humanity is having some autonomy. If you are a human nurse, you won't have say about what you do and how you do it. If you're a human patient, that means you have agency and autonomy. And if you're a doctor, you should be able to have control over what you do. Um, and I think it's relatively new um, that that's been taken away from us. Uh -huh. uh how uh, how has it been taken away from us? It's been taken away uh, in pieces, uh, such like uh, co-payments. They're saying, okay, patients can have this kind of care if they pay $100 extra. Uh, doctors can take care of people if they first collect a co-payment. Um, so there's this condition and it gets much worse with, uh, you know, deductibles, prior authorizations, uh, uh, re you know, what is it, enhanced reimbursement, uh, where like a hospital that has a lot of money, uh, like Mass General or Bellevue, uh, gets paid extra for the same service. Um, but all of those things uh, fairly directly take away um, the idea that people have choices. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, what I've, what I've uh, as, as a novelist, what I was struck by when I was invited to be at NYU Med again, and I was back into, uh, into modern medicine, which I hadn't been for a while. And I, I mean, I love NYU and they're a terrific uh, group, but in general, the things I saw were the um, I saw the miracles that that uh, we do in medicine now. I mean, high tech is fine for a lot of things, but I also noticed two things, which are in the new book, as you know, uh, money and screens. And I say the book, you know, starts with the narrator saying it's a time when money. I have to write this because it's a time when medicine could go one of two ways, either toward uh, more humanity or money and screens, which is money and money, because the screens, of course, are mostly for billing. And, uh, you know, my take is that if we just squeeze the money out of the machines, like if we had a VA system, then you lighten the load of uh, doctors and nurses and all the rest of them. And they have the time and the, the pleasure of working with patients in good relationships. Yep. And uh, what has happened now, and maybe we could talk about this, I don't know that much about pediatrics, but um, the big thing now for doctors is getting isolated in lots of ways. And I'd like to hear, you know, you've run this practice for a long time. How does this, how, are, how do you get isolated? How do you get uh, in uh, problems with, you know, the higher ups, the uh, insurance industry, et cetera. There are a few things we've done very self-consciously. Um, one, of, one of them is nobody has an office. The, there is a big room with four or five desks where nurse practitioners and doctors are all working together. Um, I'm in a room with all the social workers. Um, and we're, you know, we have, we make it a habit to say, you know, oh, uh, this is a pyogenic granuloma, who hasn't seen this or whatever. So there's this constant uh, collaboration, but our office is unusual. I mean, and what you saw at Bellevue and I see is, um, pri you know, as a condition for delivering healthcare, you have to spend uh, most of your history time with a laptop uh, and you have to spend two hours a day minimum uh, working with an electronic medical record. None of those things do patients or doctors any, any good whatsoever. Mm -hmm. 
Can you give uh, any examples about how this system has really made it more difficult to treat children and their, and their families? Well, how, you know, I had a 16 year old girl who was hell on wheels. Uh, and she was, uh, you know, in and out of emergency rooms, in and out of police uh, uh, custody. And, and her complaint to me was, I can't sleep. I can't sleep even a little bit. Um, so I said, okay, well, we're, we're going to give you some rest. And there's an, an atypical antipsychotic, which has a fairly predictable side effect of making people very sleepy. So I prescribed it for her. I next get a call uh, from the pharmacy uh, that says her insurance will not pay for it because she doesn't have schizophrenia. And I said, I know she doesn't have schizophrenia, but I want her to have this medicine. So then I have to spend time with the utilization review member, uh, uh, doctor, um, and he, he, he will not budge. So to get this girl the medicine she needed, and it worked, it gave her some rest. And uh, uh, what I had to do was I had to uh, take one of my nurses who had better health insurance, write the prescription for her in her name. She met the patients at the drugstore and got the prescription and gave it to the patient. Does that sound a little more complicated than it could have been? Yeah, yeah. Um, what, uh, what makes you stay in the practice if it's so difficult now? I mean, that's, that's uh, I, I, oppositional defiant disorder. Uh, <laughs> and, oh, you're um, just stupid, right? Or you're just, really, really stupid or really smart. I don't know. But I'm, I'm just damned if I'm going to, you know, I feel really <laughs> lucky. If I was 50, I would get out. Uh, but I feel really, really lucky. And that I'm just going to fight the bastards until I'm out of money. Uh-huh. Um, and who uh, who are these bastards uh, that you are speaking about? I thought they were. I thought you know, I, I thought that insurance agents were really great people, and you know the banks really want to help med medical care and all of that stuff. Who are the bad ones? The, the commercial what insurance. Do you, what do you have to go? Let me put it another. What do you have to go through to treat your patients humanely? It's mostly. I have to cut through um, all the preconditions. I see it as a giant toll bridge where uh, for a patient to get medical care, their household has to have spent at least $20,000 on insurance. In addition to that, they have a contract that tells them where they can go, what they can do, how they can get treated. Um, and the contracts have, have a lot to do with tier one hospitals, tier two hospitals, and it just goes on and on and on with performance metrics for this. And it's just people fall asleep because it's so boring and so intricate. Um, but patients have to do all that. And then the co-payments and stuff, I can and do because I own my own office, um, I shortcut the process. I go outside, I grab patients, I bring them back, I do my own heights and weights, and they do the co-payments and all the insurance pl pl stuff afterwards. And if they go home without paying, I'm good with that. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah. It's, um, it, it, it's worse and worse. And uh, the stranglehold is based on the fact that commercial insurers uh, get paid to deny claims. And if they decline, decline a thousand dollar claim, that's in their basket. If uh, there's a thousand dollar co-payment that goes directly to the bottom line of the insurer. And so all of these things are ways of shifting assets from poor and sick people into insurance executives, some of whom make as much as $50 million a year. Right. How somebody spends $50 million a year is beyond me. Um, you know, the weight of talking about all of this is making you sort of go down in I the know. Scene. <laughs> You know, this pressure, it's like, it's like the insurance and uh, <laughs> a partners. And I think I it think means you just started, it. you started disappearing. <laughs> really, maybe you better, you know, give them a couple of punches and then uh, get back in the screen. You know, you're not over yet. Well, in terms of... <laughs> now what? 
What do we got? I'm not, I'm. Um... You got to sit up a little bit, you know? <laughs> Don't be afraid. They can't get in this. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh... Can you see yourself in the picture now? Yeah, I see myself yeah. in the picture. Yeah. If and you start I, to slip down into the abyss of healthcare, just okay. I'll remind you. I'll, I'll okay. sit back. I'll try not to get it too intense. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's the death of a thousand cuts. I mean, the way that uh, humanity has been carved out of medical care. Um, and it's, um, yeah, it's, you know, it's, I have to write notes like uh, uh, Maggie Kerr still has no left leg and she has to go need a new prosthesis. Uh, Kenny still needs a wheelchair. He's pa paralyzed from the waist down and will be always. But I have to write letters like that on a yearly basis. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's absurd, but it's also incredibly expensive. And all that money comes from patients, flows through hospitals and doctors and ends up um, in corporate pockets. Okay, what keeps you going? <laughs> or maybe you're not going. I don't know. I, I, you I look would, like you're I'm, going. I'm doing. I'm doing fine. It energizes me. Uh, it, you know, if I wasn't my own boss, I would have left a long time ago. I actually did leave a pretty big practice because I couldn't be told what to do. Um, so what keeps me going is I am truly energized to fight for the ideals that made me go to medical school. Uh -huh. um, do you uh, have you ever got well I remembered you telling me the story when you had to join up with this I won't mention the name I think it's called <laughs> buddies or something like that this buddies big, I think it's buddies right big, big organization over all, a lot of the Harvard affiliated hospitals etc that is a middleman that is unnecessary Mm -hmm. unnecessary you know uh, what is it a 20 billion dollar thing unnecessary tell tell our wonderful attentive audience and dana uh of your you told me this before your interview with buddies and you went in and to, to see if you if they wanted to uh work with you and allow you into this uh, coveted uh, place in their uh, pantheon as a doctor right so it was explained to me that they were going to do a financial analysis of my practice by the billing uh, data and that they could tell whether or not I was uh, vi viable enough to maintain my independence or whether they would uh, offer to buy me out. Um, and I was describing, uh, for one thing, I was looking there and I had my threadbare uh, blue blazer and they all had these thousand dollar suits or more and i was making a note and i called my wife and said i knew i need new clothes <laughs> I, was, I was um i was explaining about what we had for behavioral health care we had the art room we had had an art therapist we had um all those wonderful things and and um it cut me off uh and he said all well and good, Dr. Vonnegut, but if the dollars work, nothing else matters. And the dollar, that dollars work, nothing else matters, whether they'll take you under their wonderful wing right. or not, with the claws. So. Right. Yeah. That's it's, I had it's also interesting that I had no choice. Um, I was trying to, because I have an excellent record of being a very cost effective effective doctor, I thought I could make con, you know, contracts directly with Blue Cross and those guys. And they said, absolutely not. If I wasn't coming through partners or some other uh, entity, uh, they would only pay me half of what they were paying me now. So it was like, I had no, you know, you don't have any choice. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, in Man's Fourth Best Hospital, of course, uh, it really, it really is uh, trying to to look at the injustices of the system, like I looked at the injustices in the House of God, which was just about medical training, but Man's Fourth Best Hospital is, is bigger. When, uh, with what I saw, what I needed to do was to, um, was to really look at the system, the whole system. And uh, the, it, it really boiled down to uh, you know, the seven rackets of American healthcare, which 
the fat man, you know, uh, who has taken this job at Man's Fourth Best Hospital, uh, decides he has to, to, to try to put the human back into medicine. That's what he wants to do. That's why we're talking about this, you know. And he had a free reign. He opens this, uh, this uh, public clinic uh, leaning up against Man's Fourth Best Hospital. And uh, I remember you and I had, a, had several long talks because you were in it. Because I didn't know as much about the medical, the whole medical network. You know, the, and uh, so the fat man in the middle gets up and says, as I, you know, that uh, how, you know, the six rackets of American healthcare follow the money. And it was so complex, it took us about five or six sessions at Legal Foods before <laughs> I could, could, could understand it. I mean, how they're all interlinked and everything. And, um, you know, you have to know about, Oh, and also at the end, the fat man uh, tells the group in this outpatient clinic of his what to do about it. And he's very, it's very simple. He says, squeeze the money out of the machines, squeeze the money out of the machines. So how did that make sense to you? I'm sure it did. I mean, we haven't really talked about the screens as a billing instrument. I think it was absolutely brilliant how you brought uh, the humanity back into medical care just by breaking the outgoing uh, cable or whatever. Right. So, yeah. so if you took away from physicians the, the requirement that they do coding and billing, which we're not very good at anyway, then that in itself turned things over and gave doctors more time with their patients, patients were happier, the quality of care went up. Went up. In terms of squeezing the, medicine, <laughs> squeezing the money out of medicine, I think if you take something like uh, co-payments, which are documented to hurt people, um, and you say, okay, well, we're going to, because it, we're not supposed to hurt people. So if we get rid of co-payments, that's a huge chunk of profit that we can take away from the insurers. If you say, we're going to take care uh, rid of deductibles. If we say, we're going to get rid of prior authorizations. If we're going to get rid of tiers. If we're going to get rid of provide, you know, if it, when you go right through all of these things, um, you know, it's junior high algebra to to show that these things hurt patients. And I think that's how you squeeze the medicine. You know, you, you simply go by the, we're not supposed to hurt people. If we're hurting people, we're going to stop. And stopping all those things that are highly profitable help patients. And I think that's a good way to squeeze, uh, squeeze the profits out of for-profit healthcare. Uh-huh. So uh, what, what, uh, where's the hope here? What, what do we, can we doctors do to get out from under this self-inflicted huge wound? I mean, I think you, you know, you, you give in your upcoming book, which of course I've read already, it's not, it'll be out, you know, in a few months, uh, you give this wonderful uh, description of what it's like in these days and ages to run a practice and how it's almost a killer for you. You know, I mean, it's awful. So uh, what's the, th this to my mind, and I think you're in, into this as well. This is a time when if doctors could only ally with nurses and patients and other groups, could that help? I mean, is there some way to turn this around? To put yes, this back in? <laughs> But doctors aren't good at this. We should leave the initiative and support and follow the nurses. Yeah. And if yeah. you give nurses control over staffing levels, which they used to have, the idea of uh, administrators telling nurses what to do and how to do it is very recent. And if you go, and the public will be 100% behind this, if you go with the simple idea that nurses should control nursing, again, giving them agency and autonomy and humanity, <clears throat> that in itself leads to a lot of other changes. Um, right, right. I, mean, I think the damage is profound. I think we now have vast uh, areas of this country, especially rural, but also urban, which are healthcare deserts. 
Um, we have lost 40% of our hospitals. We've lost 85% of independent community physicians. Uh, and it's like, you know, it's like, you know, breaking an expensive watch or something, trying to put oh. that all back together uh, is, right. is not as easy as hitting it with a hammer. And I think for profit medical care has hit the damn thing with a hammer for profit. Yeah. Well, that's the new book I'm working on, as you know, which you, you know, <laughs> He's one of my readers. So, yeah. so, um, so, 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 Steve, why do you keep going? I mean, you're, you're asking me why. I mean, I'm astounded. I say, here's my friend, Steve. You know, I thought you'd take a breath and you, you're writing another goddamn book. How do you do this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you why I do it, actually. Um, uh, after I had written The House of God, and then I wrote a second book called Fine, and I worked real hard on it. Second books are novels, second novels, second novels are hard. I kind of thought, why am I doing this? I've already got one job. You know, I'm a doctor, that's hard. Why am I taking on this? And Janet, you know, my wife uh, said, I spent about six months lying around in a bathtub. <laughs> you know, I was depressed, drinking, trying to figure out what the hell, why, why do this? Why do I write? And I think it's the same answer you would probably give. Most serious writers, even though we're both funny, would give. And I had this enlightening voice come. I hear voices a lot. That's one of the reasons. I, I, one of my voices that I heard said, you know, said, you do it because you can't not. Yeah. And what I'm driven by, and you too, this is why we're such good friends, I think. Um, I'm driven by these, hey, wait a second moments, which are about injustice. Mm -hmm. And most of what I write about thereafter is about uh, the danger of isolation and the healing power of good connection, yeah. right? Which is putting the human back in medicine. And uh, you know, as a last word to you, I mean, I, I have hope. I kind of feel that this uh, mess is how hope is is this has to happen right. this is a hopeful side because it can't get much worse than this and the new novel you know is as as you know is uh looking at uh it's in the covid time and looking at exactly what you said which is nobody really talks too much about it although it's starting uh, this uh closure by uh uh, private equity owners of these huge uh, chains, you know, like McDonald's or something like that, of shutting them down. I mean, uh, so um, I, you know, as I said, I, well, if only doctors could get together and work with nurses and, you know, nurses always win their strikes, you know, um, it could be better. So, um, What's, why don't we end with, since you have such a good sense of humor, can you think of something in the book, actually, uh, that is kind of funny? I mean, I'm putting you on the spot, but a funny story that you can entertain us all with, or you could just stare at the, at the, at the, at the, at the uh, I, camera, I, I, and that's funny I, enough, but I mean, if you can think of something. Well, I, some of my patients are absolutely wonderful, and I don't have to make stuff up. Um, it's like uh, a, a six-year-old, I say, uh, you have to pee in a cup. He said, what's wrong with your bathroom? I mean, <laughs> this is the greatest straight man of all times. <laughs> and a 13-year-old, his mother brings him in, he just, he just, he throws up all the time. And, and I say, well, well, Ralph, when, what do you think about this throwing up? There's no fever, there's no diarrhea. He says, it's every time my mother makes me eat eggplant. And I said, I said, I said, I think we have an answer here. And the mother says, no, he does it other times too. I said, okay, but well, let's put science to work here and let's go two weeks without eggplant and see if Ralph keeps throwing up. So, you know, this is the kind of real, this is why you practice pediatrics. Well, this is why you keep going. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're an idiot, but you keep going. That's right. That's right. Because, the, you know, I see being a doctor as sort of being, it's a judo master, you know, you just, you are looking for just the moment where you can flip somebody. 
and 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 turn things from bad to good. Well, there but, you are. All we have to do is flip healthcare. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. I have a little bit of, of advice for you about the hearing voices stuff. Yeah. Don't ever tell a psychiatrist about that. They get way too excited. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm going to call you, call, you know, oh, there's, the hand, right? okay, thanks, Mark. Well, that was really fun and smart and uh, a couple of brilliant guys just talking about what is so important, which is real description of medicine on the front lines and how hard it is to really keep the human back in medicine uh, for all of us. And I just thank you, Mark, for a terrific, terrific time.